Welcome back. So it is time today to talk to Wayne McRoy. Very happy to have him back. And our subject, of course, uh, are the Freemasons, the history of the Freemasons. And I have to say, we will probably not be able to cover everything. I mean, when I open that can of worms, oh my goodness, there's so much material. <laughs> So, but uh, yeah, Wayne, anyhow, we will do our best. Welcome back. Thanks for having me back on. Always a pleasure to speak to you. So yeah, we'll discuss the Freemasons, where they came from. We'll trace back the roots as far as we can and, uh, you know, maybe make some connections and show the, uh, the different uh, link between them and other secret society groups because they're all connected at the topmost levels all these different secret society groups the freemasons just so happen to be the most prominent in western culture right now yeah exactly so uh when there are even people out there that would argue that freemasonry actually started in the antediluvian times would the, you agree? Yeah, the, yeah, there are some people that would claim that that depends upon uh, how mm -hmm. much of what they tell you do you believe there's no way to re really prove or disprove that mm -hmm. but the the mystery schools from which the freemasons are derived they make that claim all the time that they were you know around in the antediluvian times from previous ages and on forward they trace their lineage back to egypt and then egypt they trace their lineage to before that to the atlantean period and th these are the claims they make like i said there's really no way to prove or disprove this but yeah uh, most of these secret society groups will say the same thing that they could trace their lineage all the way back as far as you know history is recorded and even before that they'll make claims because there's really no way we could know what the atlantium epoch was like uh we don't really have much recording about that the only thing the biggest thing we have is plato uh, recording his history of of Atlantis. Other than that, I mean, it's really a convoluted mess to look at the whole narrative with that to go before uh, what we would call the modern edit of things where we could trace things back to the Egyptian culture. Yeah. And um, yeah, but it is especially with the bloodline families, you know, um, these type of people they believe that and i leave it to the viewer to you know to to judge it for themselves if they are correct that it all started in antediluvian times but at the very least um what they believe they act on that and they have the resources to do it so i would say it's always good to know what they actually believe yeah, it is good to know what they actually believe. And I could tell you what it is that they teach. Uh, they teach now that this is going back. This is Freemasonry. This is the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. All of these different secret society groups, they all teach a similar spin on the same thing. Uh, but we'll focus on the Freemasonic teachings in particular right now, because that's what we're discussing primarily. What the Freemasons are taught when they get to the highest, most levels of the initiatory process in their rites is that they're taught that they are the lineage of Cain from the Bible. It goes back to the story of Cain and Abel. This is as far back as they, they could trace things. This is all the way back to what we would consider the beginning of time, right? Because this is what we're familiar with in Western culture as the Genesis story, the beginnings. So they trace their lineage all the way back to the very beginning. So they claim that they are the lineage of the line of Cain. Whereas the rest of humanity are of the lineage of Seth. Now, Seth was the, uh, the son that was born from Adam and Eve after Abel was murdered. So this was kind of Abel's replacement. Uh, and I'm pretty sure everybody's pretty familiar with the story of Cain, Cain and Abel in the Bible. So uh, the, the Freemasons believe that they are of the lineage of Cain. And also what they teach at the highest, most levels of the order is this. Cain was actually the offspring of Eve and a fallen angel named Samael. And Abel was the offspring of Adam and Eve. So 
even though they were brothers, they were only half brothers. And Cain actually had what they would consider a semi-divine bloodline because he was the offspring of a fallen angel. So they identify themselves with Cain. They call themselves the philosophers of fire. And those that are the lineage of Seth, of the godly line of Seth, they call those of the waters of faith. So these are the people that they view as being content to just live off of whatever nature provides for them, to be content to do that, rather than try to build anything or make anything better. And they call themselves the builders. They believe they're the philosophers of fire. They're the builders. They're the ones that get things done in this world. They're the ones that uh, have initiative to do things. They're the creators. They're the ones that build structures, build foundations, build better things. And they think they could improve upon God's natural creation here. So with that being the case, they see themselves as being superior because they see themselves as having this semi-divine bloodline, and therefore they have the divine right to rule. This is what they believe. This is what they teach. Uh, and those of us that they consider to be of the, uh, the, the lineage of Seth or those of the waters of faith, they see us as being what they call the quote-unquote useless eaters. So this creates this uh, dichotomy of thought wherein they think that if you don't belong to one of their secret orders, you don't even have a soul. And this is one of the teachings that falls back there too. I don't know if it's specifically the Freemasonic teachings that teach this, but I mean, this permeates all the different teachings from going back through the mystery schools. They believe uh, that, um, go ahead. Sorry, but, but do you know where I see a connection there that is definitely with Sabate Sebi? I could totally see that uh, that statement that we don't even have a soul coming from that direction you know what i mean oh i do know what you mean yeah uh, that's but that is definitely something that's taught within a lot of these secret brotherhoods these initiatory orders they believe that you have to build your soul and that you don't even have a soul unless you are a member of one of their fraternities and you go through the initiation process within their groups so they view you as little more than cattle, an intelligent animal. That's it. Human resources. Where do you think the term human resources come from? Uh, yeah. that's, that's what they view you as. So they don't have much care or consideration about your individual needs. They view you as cattle. Uh, so that's the way that they see us, these people. And, and this doesn't speak for the entire order of Freemasonry. Now, people get hung up on this because a lot of people know Freemasons or something. And most of them are just average people who didn't really know what they were getting involved in. And they don't really rise much above what they call the Blue Lodge level. This would be the first three degrees of Freemasonry. Once you hit that Master Mason mark, boom, that's it. Either you could stop advancing in the order if they don't think you have any type of occult potential and you that's just where you stay and you're just a member of the fraternity and you know you, you do that kind of thing you go down to the country club you go down to the car dealership to get a square deal and and that's pretty much what it's about it's the power base okay it's the numbers they use these people manipulate these people on the bottom rungs of freemasonry to fulfill the things that the people at the top want done within the order so they all vote the same. They all, you know, do the same things. They, they swear blood oaths to protect the secrets of the order and not let those out to the public. They also swear blood oaths to protect and help their fellow Masons when they're in distress, even to the point where they will cover up for each other's crimes. And this is documented. This is not something I'm just saying. This is a documented truth. They will cover up for each other's crimes. It's part of one of the initiation oaths they take at these different levels. So this is something that goes on within the Freemasonic fraternity in particular. Uh, it goes on to some degree in all the other fraternities as well. But uh, the bottom line here is these are the kinds of things that they, they teach and they, they swear blood oaths allegiance to the order uh, so that they will do what they're, what they're told to do or what they're expected to do without much hesitation because they don't want to be... Uh, exiled from the group first of all and second of all there have been people that have been killed for <laughs> revealing some of the secrets of the order and uh, this is documented as well if people want to go back and look that up uh, even the jack the ripper situation 
this was thought to be a Freemasonic situation, a uh, Freemasonic murder spree. So uh, you could look at all these different aspects of it. There's, there's all these different connections that can be made, but by and large, a lot of what they teach is they teach that uh, if you don't have this illumination experience, this initiation experience within their secret order, you don't develop a soul so that you are little more than an animal to be used and abused as they see fit. Uh, so, and like I said, this doesn't speak to all the members of the fraternity. Most of them don't have a friggin' clue what they're involved with. But the, as you get higher up in the levels, they don't even reveal the higher secrets to you until after you hit the 30th degree in the Scottish Rite Masonry. So uh, you really don't know much of anything up until that point. And even then, they will tell you false things as well. They, they tell false things all the way down the line of succession through the Freemasonic orders to their lesser initiates. They lie to their own members. So that should give you an indication as to what it's about. It's about controlling people. It's about manipulation. It's about power, having power over others. That's the reason why there's quote unquote secret societies. That's what secrecy is for to have power over others. Because if you know something somebody else doesn't, you have an advantage over that person. That's exactly what they've designed for themselves by keeping some of these old hidden uh, natural sciences behind closed doors and locked up in these secret societies. This goes back to the priest kings of antiquity. These were the ones that found out some, you know, secret of natural science or natural law and they kept it hidden from the, the bulk of the masses so that they had some type of an advantage over them and used it as a form of power over others. So this is what was handed down through succession through the years from antiquity through all of these different secret societies and occult brotherhoods through time that have developed from what was called the ancient mystery schools. And the Freemasons are no different and we could trace some of their lineage a little bit further forward from there. So, you know, I, I don't know which points you would like to touch on next here with it, but we yeah. can definitely move on here. Yeah, um, before we do, you just mentioned uh, Seth, uh, son of Adam, but we also have a Seth in uh, Egypt. Um, so is there any type of connection? I'm not, I'm not saying they are equal, uh, they are one and the same. That, that, that's not what I'm aiming at, but um, it strikes me as a little bit odd that this particular name pops up in both cultures. Oh yeah, definitely. We see a lot of this with different cultures around the world, probably because some of the root words and stuff are the same through different languages. So Seth was the son of Adam and Eve that was born after Abel was murdered. And we also have in the Egyptian mythology, Set. And this would be uh, the equivalent of uh, the bad guy in Egyptian mythology. Uh, so he was representative of uh, what was also called Typhon. Uh, so Set is also the name for Typhon in Egyptian mythology. And this was the bad guy in the Egyptian mythology that actually tricked Osiris into getting into a casket, a box made exactly shaped for him, and wound up murdering him and cutting him into 14 pieces and distributing the pieces throughout the world. And this has to do with a lot of uh, Freemasonic tradition too, because this is one of the, the, the mythologies that they teach upon, is the uh, mythology of Osiris, Horus, and Isis. And uh, Typhon, or Set, is a key figure in that because this is the one that decided to trick Osiris into getting in the box. Uh, so this is what happened. So Osiris is murdered, chopped up into 14 pieces, and his pieces were thrown in various parts throughout the land. And Isis in mourning and lament went out, found all the pieces except for one of Osiris and reassembled them and was able to use magic to bring him back to life. But the one piece she was missing, the 14th, the lost piece, and this is referred to as the lost word of Freemasonry, the missing piece was Osiris's phallus. So she fashioned a golden phallus, and then they conceived magically uh, Horus, the son of Osiris, who was also Osiris, reborn. And this gets a little convoluted in some of the different traditions, but essentially, uh, what this all allegorizes is the position of the sun in the sky. Mm -hmm. Horus, Horus risen, 
uh, representing the horizon. You, 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 you could hear it in the language even if you go back and you look at this yeah, stuff. And, and, and uh, then Ra would be midday. Right. Ra, Ra is also known as Osiris. He was sometimes called Ra Osiris. Mm -hmm. This is the midday sun, the sun at noon yeah. and the height of its power. This is the Osiris image. Uh, whereas uh, young, the young sun would be Horus. The older mm -hmm. sun is Osiris and Set is the one that uh, murdered Osiris and represents the darkness. So at sun set, the sun mm -hmm. goes down and is buried in the earth until the next morning, the dawn of the new day. And this plays a lot of role in different secret society groups too. The golden dawn, the order of the golden dawn. Uh, all these things represent the same imagery here. It goes back to the Egyptian mythos here. Uh, so a lot of what they teach is based upon the old Egyptian mythos, which is an allegorized version of alchemical processes and is often related to the sun, the position of the sun in the sky and the importance of the sky clock. So this is one of the things that's uh, represented in those myths. And if you know how to break down the zodiacological signs and everything represented in the myths, you can see the position of the sun for each of these things and understand that it allegorizes the seasons and the cyclical nature of the world. So it, it encapsulates a lot of natural science in the mythology as well. So these same myths have been repeated through the years and translated into various languages and have been repeated through different cultures in just different story forms. Uh, but a lot of it allegorizes the sun, the sun and the phallic principle, the force, the nature of the force, the life force, the life giving force. This force is how they refer be, to it. Be the force uh, with you. <laughs> well, where do you be think? The force and the force be with you, something <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, where do you think Star Wars came up with the idea yeah. of the force? Because this is, this is one of the teachings of these secret society groups. They teach that. Uh, the universe has always been, it's like this world and the universe we live in has always been existent. Primordial matter has always been, but it was in a state of chaos until the grand architect of the universe came along and made order out of that chaos and built the earth and gave us all of these uh, this order and natural laws that we're familiar with. This is what they teach. And they view the grand architect of the universe as more of a force than an actual entity or intelligent being. They see it as an intelligent force. So they often refer to it as the force or the generative force. And that's uh, what some of them claim the G in the Freemasonic symbol stands for, the generative force. Some of them claim it stands for ge geometry. Some of them claim it stands for God. Some of them claim it stands for Gnosis. All these different things could be substituted in here, but this is also one of the ways they lie to their lower level initiates. They tell them that this G represents something else. Now, like the lowest level ones, they'll tell them the G stands for God. And that's very vague, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, so th this is the kind of stuff that they do. But these are, are many of the things that they teach. So the point being here, the idea of the force being represented in Star Wars, uh, that was not an accident. That does, did not originate with George Lucas. Don't think for a second it did. This ties back to all these same old ancient mythologies. And Star Wars is crafted as a modern mythology for our modern sensibilities. That's what's been done here. And they even touched upon every single aspect in the movie, the original Star Wars movie, of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey that he outlined in his critique on mythology. It, and that's why it was such a success. It hits on all these key points, these archetypal uh, thought forms that manifest in all the great storytelling arcs, because it hits on something primal in man. We could all relate to it in some degree or another. But this is where the idea of the concept of the force came from, from the teachings directly from Freemasonic material, uh, because that's what they teach on, the generative force, which they equate to the phallus and to the sun. So much of these early uh, mystery schools, the exoteric form they took on, were what you would call solar phallic cults. And there's a lot of writers that teach upon this and talk upon this, like Max Heindel of the Rosicrucian, Rosicrucian Brotherhood. Excuse me. Uh, so you have people that talk about these kind of things, and that's where much of the imagery has come from, what much of the symbology represents.
So it all ties back to these same archetypal uh, symbols, so to say. But that's essentially one of the things that they teach. And it, it harkens back to Egyptian mythology. Now, they also claim that the Egyptian mythology comes from earlier times, from the Atlantean period, the Atlantean epoch. And that's where the Egyptians carried forward their belief systems and their teachings. Yeah. So um, I would like to circle back to uh, the secret societies and mystery school for a minute. Um, I talked about the subject, the mystery schools with uh, Troy McLaughlin recently. And, um, you know, let's say in our current situation, um, the governments come cracking down really, really hard. Yeah. I could imagine, for instance, that there will be people that, um, you know, secure, let's say, the studies. Uh, the real studies about the Jamba Jews uh, and so on and so forth, and uh, that they also secure other knowledge, um, but they might go dark for a longer period of time because it is simply not safe. And um, yeah, and then you, before you know it, you because everything has to happen, in secret before you know it you have a secret society yeah so um i can understand that at certain times in history because um yeah the circumstances were really bad that knowledge had to go underground you know what i mean it, it could not be openly discussed Right. And I understand that concept, too. And that is often a go to explanation for many of these secret society groups. For instance, mm. the Freemasons will claim, and this is why they claim to have such animosity toward the Christian church too. many of these secret society groups. They claim it was because of the persecution of the church uh, for heresy and for different things like that, for the things that they were teaching when they were talking about mysticism and that kind of stuff, that they had to use a secret type language and symbols to hide the true teachings. So this is the claim that they make, and they claim that it was because of the church, the Christian church, the uh, Vatican, per se. So they, that's the claim that they make. That's why they say all of this stuff is allegorized in uh, this the symbology and this, uh, the quote unquote, green language that they use in Freemasonry and other of these secret teachings. But see, that's a misnomer because the secrecy has been going on since long before the church age. Yeah. So it's a convenient excuse for them. That's all mm -hmm. that it is at this point. Now, I understand sometimes to uh, keep the, the stream of knowledge going forward. Yes, you did have to be quiet about it somewhat and be very careful with it, uh, depending mm -hmm. upon the culture you're living in. That's definitely a thing. We've seen that borne out through history. But it's a convenient excuse for them at this point, because the secrecy has been going on since long before the church age. And that's the whole point here. Very early on in the earliest known history of man, the earliest of priest kings, these first people that discovered some of these hidden secrets of natural science and how natural law works in the natural world, kept this knowledge hidden from the rest of the public at that time so that they could wield some power over them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is what they did. And they carefully chose who their successors would be, who they trusted also with this type of knowledge. And they've kept this kind of thing moving forward through time. This is why the secrecy, because in order to have, as we discussed here, power over somebody else, if you know something they don't, well, that gives you a form of power over them. And this was essentially what the priest kings of, the, of antiquity knew that the rest of the public didn't. So they created these whole, uh, how should we say, systems based upon this secret knowledge where they gave it an exoteric religious form and they practiced these different exoteric forms. And only the priest kings or those initiates within the order, within the mystery schools of that order, understood the true meanings, the esoteric meanings behind that, where most of the public were just given the exoteric doctrine and followed along with that. Thus, you come up with all these different cults, like the Dionysian cult 
and the Thracian cult and all of these different cults that we see and all these different mythologies in antiquity that went on where people re reverenced gods. I would argue that the gods that they reverenced in these mythologies are nothing more than aspects of nature personified in stories uh, given through an esoteric type teaching under using the language of symbology. But the exoteric form of that took on kind of a life of, of its own and became a religious function. And with our history being misdescribed to us, the historians took this down and accepted it as fact. I don't think ancient peoples were so stupid as to think, okay, well, the god Zeus is going to throw a lightning bolt down. I don't think their daily experience reflected that. I think they were just reverencing an aspect of nature in a certain way, paying respect and homage to it. But it kind of got personified in a human type form and given to the people in an exoteric teaching. And the historians of the mainstream misconstrued everything and believed that these people went around worshiping these gods and doing this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's hard to really know anything much about that because much of it is misdescribed to us, but uh, there's no way to truly prove or disprove at this point what those people's daily lives were like. All we could do is go back and look at what we have as historical records or archaeological finds on this kind of thing. And that only reveals so much. So a lot of what's been presented to us as historical fact is just the perspective of somebody that was looking at the evidence here. So we have to either prove, you know, we have to trust what they say or distrust what they say. And it's hard to know anything as an absolute beyond our own lifetimes. So that that's the whole point here. We've we've been through such convoluted history. Uh, especially in the times we're living in, we see it going on in real time, right? They talk about fake news. Well, fake history has got to be 10 times worse than fake news. What's true? Who writes what's true? Who, who are the historians? What do they document? Well, the winner always documents the history. So there's always some kind of a bias or skew to everything. So it's hard to know for sure what's factual and what's not. But as far as the mythologies go, these represent these archetypal forms. So we have something that's potent here. So regardless of whether it's an actual history or not, the story itself has a very real effect on the human mind uh, because it does touch upon these archetypal type concepts, which archetypes are, for people who may not know, this is something that's inherently known to the human being uh, without any kind of prior education or knowledge on it. It's something we all see and identify with. Uh, in the scientific community, they would call it ancestral memory, genetic memory, epigenetic memory, these kind of things. In the occult movement, they call it the, uh, the Akashic record. They, they call it by different things, ancestral memories, this kind of stuff. Whereas you could have an inherent response to something and recognize it on a, on a level, an unconscious level, without having a conscious knowledge of it. Like for instance, like if you take a baby and show them a picture of a snake, they're probably going to have a negative reaction to that. That's because of this archetypal nature of this thing, this uh, inherent memory that we all have. And it, it strikes on the unconscious mind. Now your unconscious mind understands it and recognizes it, but your conscious mind doesn't. So what happens is your unconscious mind will see it and register it, and it will have a subconscious effect on you, which will later reflect in your conscious behavior somehow. So this is a useful tool for those programmers of this world, for those you know uh, dark occultists who run this place, as I like to call them. They use this all the time to steer social behavior, and it's called social engineering, and it's been going on for a very long time now. Mm. Um, I listened to a gentleman who gave a talk about Freemasonry, and uh, he also said, yes, I am a Freemason. Um, I think it's only fair to disclose that uh, before I start talking. And, um, <clears throat> and then um, at one point, he explained that one of their core tenants is to make the world a better place by bettering yourself. 
And I have to say, if it were only that, I would, I'm on board because I think what is really lacking in society at large is proper knowledge and the tools and the will actually to work on yourself and doing it, yeah, and um, not trying to avoid it. But yeah, I have a strong feeling it actually doesn't stop there. Well, it's probably important that he did go ahead and, and tell you up front he's a Freemason, because if he's a Freemason, then he's bound to a blood oath to not reveal the secrets of the order to you. Uh, so therefore, you know, what he's telling you may or may not be true. And a lot of times you do hear one of the uh, recruitment type slogans, even though they, they claim they don't recruit, the Freemasons don't recruit, you have to go and knock on the lodge and ask uh, to join and then they'll they'll vote. And if there's a black ball in the box, then you're you're declined. But if there's not, then they'll accept you. But this is what they claim anyway. But uh, at any rate, the thing is, that is one of the things that they say, they take good men and make them into better men. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, that's what the claim is. It's about bettering yourself. And there is some of that that goes on. Not everything about these uh, secret society groups is negative, right? Mm -hmm. There are positive aspects to it. And it is about building your own character and building your own type of integrity at certain points. Uh, some of the teachings do reflect good things. Uh, so that the problem is you take some of these good teachings and you mix in that just that little teeny bit of poison with it. And that's wherein you have a problem. And the higher up the ladder of the structure you go, the more corruption you find in it, just like anything else in this world. Because at the top of the power pyramid, there's somebody that has their own agenda and their own goals in mind. And they don't care about the well-being of their underlings, but they'll string them along with whatever they think they need to get them to take that next step. So they dangle the carrot of secrecy in front of them. Well, if you keep going with this, then maybe eventually you'll begin to understand some of the deeper secrets of the, uh, the Freemasonic teachings. And at some point, you may even develop special powers if you follow all the teachings, and this is a you know a promise that's made through all these different occult fraternities and stuff like that, at some point you can, uh, if, uh, how should we say this? If you, they teach that if you follow their teachings and you're just good enough, you're just smart enough, you're just holy enough, you're just pure enough or spiritual enough, you might be able to attain superhuman type faculties, things like clairvoyance, Powers Turning like water this. into wine. <laughs> yeah, the, these powers of discernment and, and this kind of thing. And, and, you know, powers over the physical world and, and various things like that. This is what they teach, but it's always just out of your reach because you're just never good enough. And that's the big secret at the top of it all is they, they don't have that either. But it's just a way to string you along. See, it's mm -hmm. all about control with these people. But, uh, at any rate, a lot of these teachings are based upon some of the old alchemical or uh, natural sciences that go way back. And the original intentions were way different than what's been brought forward today. Uh, that's where we get a lot of this convoluted thought. These things have been twisted from their original intention and turned completely 180 degrees around to mean the opposite, the exact opposite of what they used to be. So it's the inversion process going on, and it's all about building a completely artificial system out of what we have here in com uh, complete opposition to the natural system. So it's about inverting nature 180 degrees. And that's what they're trying to build here. And it always invariably leads to a little something called transhumanism. So yeah. this is what I've discovered largely through my studies. Uh, if you follow the trail all the way back as far as you could go, you always find find these old occult natural sciences in the mystery schools of antiquity, if you follow it backwards through time. And if you follow the trail forward through time, you always invariably come to the transhuman singularity, uh, which is the fulfillment of their quote unquote great work in Freemasonry. This will be the, the point at which mankind becomes God. And that's what they've always been wanting for from time immemorial. They want to be God in no uncertain terms. They want immortality and they want total absolute control of everything. 
And they see that as being within their grasp now with the advent of modern technologies. So with that being the case, that's what they've been working towards. And they also view this and call this the philosopher's stone, the, the ability to achieve this immortality, this transhuman singularity, that's their philosopher's stone. That's not with always the original intention of these uh, terms were like the great work and the, the philosopher's stone, but that's what it's become through the advent of these modern secret society groups. And Freemasonry is one of the big pillars of that because it is probably the most well-known secret society group in modern society. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he also mentioned that um, when, that they will ask you before they accept you, um, do you believe in a supreme being? And uh, your answer should be yes. You do not have to define it. You do not have to explain it. But that belief must be there. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And he said that he actually enjoys um, meeting people from all over the world, from all cultures, from all faiths uh, that are coming to the lodge. And that is, to me, that is such an important point. Um, because many people will say, yeah, no, 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 the, this person is not a Freemason, he's a Catholic, he's this, he's that, he's a Buddhist, he's a Muslim, and, and, and what have you. Um, yeah, that's true, but the minute they enter uh, into their secret society, all of that falls away, and it doesn't matter anymore. Right, and that's a, that's a huge point in that whole thing. They must acknowledge that they believe in a higher power of some sort. They don't have to define that and they don't ask, right? They, they don't want you to use that name, especially if it's the name of Jesus Christ in the lodge. Like if you're praying in the lodge, they, you know, if you say in the name of Jesus or something afterwards, no, they'll take you aside and tell you, hey, you can't do that here. Uh, they, they take umbrage with that. They don't want to acknowledge any specific type of God but, or higher power, but they want you to acknowledge a higher power of some sort. Mm -hmm. There's various social engineering aspects to this uh, for that reason, but uh, one of which is because you put this in, in effect, what this does is this makes you usurp uh, the, the what you consider to be God or your creator you usurp that authority to the brotherhood and you put the brotherhood first, see? So it's kind of like putting an idol, if you want to look at this in Christian theological terms, it, it makes the false idol out of something. So it puts an idol before God uh, in, in you know, that kind of a viewpoint. So the brotherhood is now your new God, big brother, right? Where do you think the term big brother comes from too? The brotherhood, that's how they're universally known in, in various different uh, uh, places in the world. They're known as the brotherhood. Uh, and all of these different secret society groups are, are known as the brotherhood, uh, yeah. are referred to vaguely as the brotherhood. Yeah, there is a very interesting movie, older movie. And, and last time I checked, it was still available on YouTube. It's called Brotherhood of the Bell. And uh, that was very interesting because this gentleman, he, um, he joined a, this Brotherhood of the Bell and actually he didn't hear from them for 20 years. And then they came and had a mission for him. And that if, if memory serves, that mission was to kill somebody. And that is where he totally uh, freaked out. And that was something that he, and he, he wasn't counting on it. You know, he, he thought, yeah, I will never hear from them. And yeah, it really, really got him uh, into trouble in that movie. Yeah, and that's, that's an interesting thing too, because when you do swear these allegiances and these blood oaths, I mean, that's a very real possibility. They could ask you to do something you're not comfortable with, but uh, mm -hmm. your choice is to do it and be quiet about it or to not do it and be ostracized from the group and maybe potentially have some really bad ramifications for that. Uh, you know, there have been murders that have been committed in the name of people violating their Masonic oaths. 
Uh, so like this kind of thing is a known commodity uh, at some point, like after you reach a certain level within the brotherhood, you understand that you're going to have to either do what they say, or you might have some really bad consequences for it. Uh, so it's an interesting dichotomy of thought when you, you get to that point. But uh, at any rate here, um, these secret brotherhoods, they're all interlocked at the topmost levels. The Freemasons and all these other groups, the Jesuits, uh, the, uh, the Rosicrucians, the Order of the Eastern Star, uh, the, the, uh, the Golden Dawn, the OTO, that's a particularly negative one, but uh, it's, it's definitely part of it. And all of these different secret society groups, they all interlock at the topmost levels. And uh, we would commonly refer to those today, the topmost level that uh, it's all united at, as the Illuminati. And that's mm -hmm. a term that's been thrown around and they've tried to discredit and things like that. But it certainly does exist. And it certainly exists today still, even though there's people that claim that it does not, but it does exist. It exists under various different names. And they will also tell you that they call themselves the Illuminati at certain points as well. Uh, so I, it's a real thing, it exists, and it's you know the unification at the topmost levels of all these different secret society groups because they all teach basically aspects of the same teachings throughout all these different occult fraternities. It's all based upon the same core tenets. Uh, and that's the important thing here. So if you're a Freemason, and you know you you think you have nothing in common with people in within the OTO uh you're mistaken it's all the same teachings and oftentimes they will use freemasonry as a recruiting ground for some of these higher occult orders so it's something you have to keep in mind with this the freemasons are just the most well known uh, of these secret society groups that's the thing now the vast level they're sorry the vast majority of the people involved are at a level where they don't have a clue any of this is going on because most Masons will join the lodge and they'll stay in, like I said, what they call the blue lodge, which is the first three degrees of Freemasonry. And they'll go and they'll have their spaghetti dinners and they'll go to their boring lodge meetings and talk about uh, the, the treasury and money situation and donations and stuff like this. And, you know, it's, it's kind of boring really, but they, they have, they get special deals down at the country club and they get special deals at the car dealership because their buddies own businesses and stuff and they all support each other and give themselves discounts and everything else. So it's kind of like a social group in that way. But what they don't realize is at the higher levels, there's more nefarious things going on. Now, at the higher levels, they would refer to these Blue Lodge Masons as what they call porch Masons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so <clears throat> this is one of the things where they kind of disrespect their own membership because it's it's kind of looking down their nose on them because they don't know any of the big secrets or what's really going on. They're just, like I said, the power base, the base that goes out and gets things done. It's the numbers, the numbers game. So uh, a lot of these people are used and don't even really realize it because they don't know what goes on because they don't really have an unction to go look at the old writings that are in the Masonic libraries and things like that. They just want to be part of the group because they get social benefits from it and that's it. And they think they're doing something good. Yeah. I once heard somebody, um, yeah, explaining a, uh, yeah, an initiation and a, a certain stage of initiation. And I don't know if that is true, but I will just let you know and you will tell me what you make of that. And um, <clears throat> so within that initiation, there came a point when um, the people had to spit on the Bible. And um, so then let's say you refused to do that. Then they said, yeah, well done brother and uh, good work and uh, but you will always stay on your level that yep. where you are you will never ascend <laughs> and uh, yeah you basically you just keep doing porch masonry um, yep. but in case you do spit on the bible then they take you away and they give you a little bit more knowledge and yeah you are already nodding you think that is yep. not made up no, I've heard that from multiple sources. I think that's uh -oh. a, a, 
I think that's a true statement. I've heard that same thing several times from various other sources. Uh, so I think there's something more to that. That's one of the uh, ways that they know whether or not the initiate would possibly be a candidate for higher learning within the order and be, uh, you know, plausible for occult teaching within that, or if they're just going to be one of those base level members that just stays at the master mason level and is, you know, one of the dudes that does the spaghetti dinners and stuff like that and, and thinks that they're, they're doing something good in the world, which don't get me wrong, some of these fraternities, they do do good things, right? They, they do, you know, these, these good works uh, to try to make themselves look better and to uh, negate some of the negative things they do, because it, it's all about balancing the karma. They have different ways of doing this. And, you know, this is one of the things they believe too, that uh, because of the negative thing they do, they should probably do good things to outweigh that. Uh, so it's, it's you know, this dichotomy idea. of thought. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> That's just... not even possible. <laughs> no, I you know. know. It's... <laughs> if you kill somebody, do you honestly believe you can make up for that by building 20 hospitals? That's that seems to be what they uh, they go by. I mean, they they think it's it's karma, right? That that's the way they view it. It's it's the karmic attribution of things, but it's a convoluted way of looking at things. And there are some you know very occult teachings that go along with that, and they look for workarounds for karmic retribution on things too. Uh, so that's that's one of the ways that they they do that kind of thing is they'll try and outperform with good deeds what they did with bad deeds. Uh, but they'll also use methods like coercion for people to garner their consent for things, which that's not even like truly a good thing, but they don't view it as being evil either because the person eventually consented. Uh, and, and we've seen so much of this go on the past two years with the events happening in the world where they use coercive tactics to get people to consent to something that they probably had no interest or no, uh, no, idea that they wanted to go ahead and, and consent to that thing mm. so it's it's one of the methods they use and they see that as being a workaround for karmic principles coming back on them because they mm. if they could trick people into giving their consent well they still got their consent so th therefore they won't get any negative karmic retribution for that yeah so when I listened to that gentleman who said I am a mason and um, he explained a couple of things um, I thought to myself so we do have two possibilities here either he is a member of porch masonry and really doesn't have a clue which is possible um, or he is very good at um, keeping the secret and then later on I thought maybe that is why they do it you know they send out uh, those members of the blue lodges and um, and and they can say what they say you know wholeheartedly without flinching without having uh, to think oh i'm lying because that is what they know and they do not know anything else do do you think that might be a propaganda tool Oh, definitely. Uh, this is something that's used in politics and stuff, too. It's called plausible deniability. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, most of these people that join the Masons, then, you know, they, they wind up in the Blue Lodge. They don't see anything nefarious going on there. They just think it's a bunch of guys that get together, do spaghetti dinners, do outreaches for the community, do positive things and just try to make themselves better people and, you know, maybe get some good deals down at the, the local businesses and stuff like that because of their affiliations but uh, they don't see anything nefarious about it. So that's their experience. And of course, they're going to go out and say, no, none of that goes on because that hasn't been their experience because they haven't been introduced to the higher level teachings. And I can almost assure you that the vast majority of Masons, of these porch Masons, as we call them, or the Blue Lodge Masons, most of them have never even picked up one of the Masonic books in the Masonic library there and read through it. Otherwise, they might have a better understanding of what goes on. But this is one of the ways in which they could go ahead and have Masons go out there and make these claims or whatever, that there's nothing nefarious going on. And they don't necessarily have to lie to do that because they firmly believe themselves that that's how it works and there's nothing more to it. 
and that all of uh, us out there that talk about this stuff are conspiracy theorists, right? I don't know how many times I've been labeled with that moniker, but uh, it's definitely, I could show you in their own words, the things that they teach and they say, I, I've done it. In fact, I, I've made a career of it now at this point. Uh, yeah. I, that's what I do. That's most of the time what I talk upon is these various books, these older books from the various secret mystery school teachings and stuff like that, that they, they bring forward and tells you what they're all about in their own words, their own mm -hmm. teachings. So, you know, but it is what it is. Again, even there, it's our own ignorance that keeps us from seeing what is really going on. Because I mean, hello, it is not that complicated. Go to your library, pick up a book by Albert Mackey or um, read a book, let's say Manly P. Hall, blah, 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 blah. And um, yeah, you will stumble on things um, that you have never heard about, most yep. likely in your Blue Lodge. But even there, you know, there is this willful ignorance. That is what really drives me nuts. Right. And, you know, I mean, a lot of Freemasons might be a little uh, taken aback to hear that Manly P. Hall in one of his works will say things like uh, the key to the warrior on the block in, in, is uh, such and such. And if you do so, then you'll have the energies of Lucifer in your hands. Uh, mm -hmm. Like it, it's it's in their their books. Or if you go and you pick up uh, something by uh, uh, Christopher Pike. Right. Uh, or, yeah, Albert Pike, sorry, I'm thinking of the Star <laughs> Trek so show. <laughs> it happens anyway. to the best. <laughs> <laughs> Albert Pike. But anyway, if you pick up his, his books, he tells you in no uncertain terms uh, that uh, they, they revere Lucifer as the great architect of the universe and this kind of thing. So it's like if they haven't had any uh, exposure to these types of, of, of books from some of their most notable uh, teachers within the order and influencers within their own orders, they don't know that this is what goes on there. They just think it's a, a good, an old boys club down there, right? They think that they're doing something good. They're just, it's a social outreach for the community and they're just making good men, better men. And that's all they're doing. Uh, yeah. So you can't argue with them. That's been their experience. And they'll tell you whole, wholeheartedly, that's, that's the truth. This is what I've experienced. I've been a Mason for 20 years and I've never seen anything like that going on. Well, yeah, you haven't been, you know, shown the upper echelons of the ladder then. So <laughs> that kind of thing, but yeah, at it, any it, rate. It, it's like you are a worker in a company. You don't know what's going on upstairs. What they, they if they are already planning, uh, you know, to lay off. Mm. Right. Yeah, let's say 5,000 workers or what, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But uh, at any rate, uh, the Freemasons, I'll tell you, it's, it's an interesting group to look at because they have a lot more books and stuff available out there for public perusal than many of the other secret society groups. So it's easier to find Freemasonic texts than it is to find, say, Rosicrucian texts or mm -hmm. texts from the OTO or from all, all these various other secret societies. And trust me, I search. I search for this stuff. I diligently look for it. And the older the book, the better, uh, because you're going to get more accurate information from that. So uh, these are the kinds of things I look at and, and read from to try to discern what it is that uh, they're actually teaching and what it is they believe and are pushing forward. So uh, the Freemasons have a lot of stuff. I would recommend if you're interested in Freemasonry, pick up Manly P. Hall's book, The uh, mm -hmm. Secret Teachings of All Ages. Uh, that, that's a good primer. That's a good primer to know a lot of things that they teach within these different orders. And you may be surprised to learn some of that if you're not familiar with Freemasonry. So uh, they, they trace a lot of their origins back to the Knights Templar as well. And this is mm -hmm. one of the traditions that they, they uphold within uh, the Freemasons, they trace their lineage back to the Templars. Now, yeah, there's been a couple in, things that, go ahead. Um, and in uh, the Scottish York, right, um, one of the higher uh, degrees is actually Knights Templar. 
Oh yeah, yeah. You have to be a a Knight Templar or of the thirty second degree of the Scottish Rite to become a Shriner, uh, the 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 Knights of the Mystic Shrine. Uh, people might not be familiar with that group. That's a subgroup of the Masons. And uh, you have to be very highly degreed within the Freemasonic order to become a Shriner. And these are the ones that are known for building the children's hospitals and things like that. So, you know, it's I actually did a, a great breakdown on who the Shriners are in their own words by reading from one of their official books on my mm -hmm. channel on Rockfin. Uh, actually, I think I put it out there in podcast form, too, on my Alchemical Tech Revolution podcast. So that's available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If anybody's interested in learning more about the Shriners, what they were uh, based upon, what they, where they came from, and what their teachings and philosophy are, who they really are. And, and it may be a far cry from what you think it's about. So uh, the, it's an interesting group to look at, too. But you have to be very highly ranked within Scottish Rite Freemasonry or York Rite Freemasonry to become a Shriner, and you have to be a Knight Templar. Uh, and this is an important thing to the Masons, the Knights Templar. They trace a lot of their lineage back to that. And, you know, they claim that what happened is when the Templars were arrested by uh, the King of France and the Pope back in, I think it was 1307, if memory serves me correctly, they had to disappear very quickly out of France. So what they did is they took to the seas and they used the skull and crossbones flag on their ships and Got became involved. the pirates of old. And they sailed to Scotland. And this is where they get the Scottish right from. They sailed to Scotland and established a lodge there in secret. And uh, there was a rebellion called the Peasants' Rebellion that happened that was supposedly uh, orchestrated by this group of Freemasons. Uh, you could look this up. I'm trying to think of the name of the book that talks about this. Um, I'll think of it at some point, but there's a book it, it that highlights this whole history. On. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I, I'm, I'm an avid reader and I read so many things. It's hard to keep them straight sometimes. But there's a <laughs> book that highlights this whole happening of how the, the, the Templars took to the seas. They settled in Scotland and they started this peasants rebellion there. And uh, from there, they were able to uh, set up new lodges, other places, and they established in the early 1700s what would be our modern Freemasonic lodges. Uh, so this is what's said to have happened, but I can't think of the name of that book. It'll come to me <laughs> at some point, but th this is all outlined by other people too. I mean, it's not something I'm saying. Uh, this is out there in the, the mainstream you know, public uh, mm -hmm. venue out there. Yeah. Would you say it's um, Freemasonry is, uh, yeah, uh, male dominated? Oh, certainly it is. Uh, there was a, a time where you couldn't become a Freemason if you were a woman. Now they have what's called co-masonry, which is actually an offshoot of the Theosophical Society. And they also have the Order of the Eastern Star, which is an offshoot of the Freemasonic Lodge where women can join. So now those things have been kind of in, ingratiated into Freemasonic culture. And uh, there's also, there's always been this, you, you had to, at one time, you could only be of white European descent to join the Masons. And if you weren't, there were special lodges for you. They were called uh, uh, Prince, Prince Hall lodges, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm trying to think back. It's been a while since I looked at that, but uh, they have their own special lodges for people of different ethnicities and colors. Well, all that's kind of been ingratiated into free, the mainstream Freemasonic societies now, but uh, all of those things existed at one point too. There were all these different spinoff groups where if you didn't belong to the classical, uh, say, uh, archetype that they were looking for, you had these other options you could go to as far as secret societies and learn some of the same stuff secret teachings yeah so i thank you so much for the first hour um it's already uh, gone my goodness that was fast and uh yeah um that was it the public hour and uh, we will see the patrons on the other side until next time <laughs>